All right. Uh, hi, good afternoon, folks. How are you folks doing today? Hope you're enjoying your Cisco Live experience. Uh, my name is Brian Gonzalez, and I have here Shama Pala. Uh, we are with the uh, Cisco Identity Services Engine uh, Business Unit. And today we're here to talk to you about Cisco PX Grid and how we build integrations using Cisco PX Grid. So show of hands, how many of you folks uh, know what Cisco ICE is, Identity Services Engine? Perfect. Uh, how many of you folks have, have experience with Cisco PX Grid? Perfect. And may I ask which integration you're using? FMC. Anyone using non-Cisco integrations? OK. So I'll, we'll talk today about what PX Grid is in the summary. This is DevNet 1010. We have another advanced session on Thursday, DevNet 1015, which goes a little more in deep. Uh, and tomorrow, we have a workbench where you can actually come over and you can begin to uh, exercise, do some lab exercises to understand what PX Grid is from a developer perspective. So the reason why we kind of build PX Grid is um, uh, context, we believe, is, is currency. Uh, knowing you know, who, the, who the user is, what IP address it is, and metadata around that can help products work together better. So there are systems which uh, can give us information like, you know, like ICE. ICE gives you information on uh, the AAA aspects, the radius aspects. Uh, we have information from partners like MDM vendors that give you information about the mobile endpoints. We have uh, firewalls, we have threat defense vendors that can consume this information and likewise. So if, if we try to build integrations by trying to connecting all these partners together, we will end up with a very difficult way of doing point-to-point -point integrations. So we have a solution that's called PX Grid that allows us to share this information in a much more easier, much more elegant, scalable manner. All right, and we call that PX Grid uh, for context sharing. So let me talk to you about why we kind of built an ecosystem around Cisco ICE. So as you folks know, ICE, its day job is doing AAA, uh, authenticating, uh, the user doing the authentication, the authorization, and the accounting. And as part of doing his day job, we also do profiling. So we understand what endpoint is coming on the network. We understand uh, what AD group the user belongs to. We understand uh, different elements about uh, whether you come on wired, you come on wireless, or you come on VPN. So we initially in ICE 1.0, we, we built an ecosystem with sharing that information over syslog to vendors uh, like sim vendors, like the ArcSight, the Splunks, the logarithms. And uh, the benefit of that is that you could take that context that we bring and we can associate that in these products. So take Splunk, for example. Instead of just having an alert that comes on IP address 10.10.10.1, it is... Uh, 10.10.10.1, but it is Sham on his MacBook Pro. Uh, he's had a posture failure. He's come over the VPN. And he's currently active on the network. So that is much better than just IP addresses. You have more context now, so you can take meaningful action. Another reason why we have an ecosystem around ICE is um, ICE doesn't know everything. We can use partners to consume information. So to give you an example, we work with MDM vendors like Mobile Lion, AirWatch, uh, SAP, uh, uh, Sophos, et cetera, where we can get telemetry on the mobile endpoint, right? Uh, what kind of OS is running? Is it Android? Is it Apple? Is it jailbroken? Is it rooted? Does it have a pin lock enabled? And then you can use that telemetry, and you can basically use that in ICE policy. That means. If Brian comes on the network uh, using my iPad, I give him access to the guest VLAN. But if he's part of the management group, I give him access to more granular resources. But if he's jailbroken his iPad, put him in quarantine. So you can vary someone's 
authorization permissions based on telemetry that you learned from another partner. So the third important thing that we are doing with our ecosystems is, that is unique to Cisco, is we allow our partners to reach back into the network. And uh, we call this adaptive network control. I'll talk more about this. But with our integrations, a partner such as a Splunk or a Checkpoint or a Tenable Nessus or any partners like FMC, uh, the Cisco partners like Stealthwatch, WSA, uh, based on what they learn, they can signal ICE to take a network mitigation action. So it basically forms what is called as using the network as an enforcement point. So, uh, trying to talk to you folks more about you know, what the use case is for identity awareness. Uh, in systems where you just get alerts on traditionally where you've had you know, maybe a, an IP address, a source IP address, and a destination IP address, how do you help uh, answer these questions? You know, is this a server? Is it a smartphone? Is that device still on the network? Uh, did it come out the VPN? What is their posture? What else is on the network? All this is provided by ICE, because ICE has that context that's on the network. Another, another way we can use this context is um, doing things like application access control. So for example, uh, today, uh, if you try to access uh, applications into the cloud, you use, you know, you basically would use maybe the AD group information, like who the user is, what group he belonged to, and then give access. But think if you will, what if you could change that and say, not only who the user is, but you know, where the person is coming from, uh, what time of day, uh, is it on VPN access or not? And you could then vary that based on uh, that rules for critical data, non-critical data. So that's why we have partnerships with uh, uh, IAM and single sign-on providers that use this information to vary authorization, uh, authorization to cloud applications like Salesforce or Office 365, et cetera. So um, what we did was we built up an ecosystem around PXGrid. Today we are around 50 partner integrations that have adopted PXGrid, uh, ranging from vendors like IAM, single sign-on, to forensics, to user behavior analytics, to CASB providers, to um, uh, firewall and policy management providers, and what we call as rapid threat containment providers. So remember, uh, a few slides ago, I told you that we first built our ecosystem around ICE uh, uh, using syslog. And then uh, we had requests from our customers to integrate, integrate systems like MDM. So we created an MDM API. Then we created, uh, we figured out, because our customers wanted us to integrate with many different technologies, by doing one-to-one -one integrations, it was not going to make sense. So what we did was smart people at Cisco, like Sham, actually developed this, this technology called Platform Exchange Grid. So what is PX Grid? PX, think of PX Grid as a messaging bus or messaging fabric for our partners' products to integrate into. So instead of doing one-off APIs, we provide our partners with a client, an SDK. That's the grid client library. And our partners, basically, what they do is they take that client and they stitch it into their product. They compile it with their product. Once they compile it in a customer's ICE deployment, they can attach to the grid. The reason why we did this is that this grid or this messaging bus is based on XMPP that we use in Cisco Jabber and Cisco Collaboration, which can scale to millions of subscribers. And very importantly, it is a bi-directional publish subscribe bus as opposed to a one-off REST API. So with that, you can have multiple systems that basically connect to the grid and can start sharing information. So what happens is, just as how a user would have authenticated to ICE, been authorized to ICE, and then be allowed onto the network, similarly, our partners 
after they integrate in an ICE deployment, they need to authenticate to the ICE controller because PX3 is the ICE controller. They are authorized, and then what they do is that they, they publish what they want to share. So ICE is the, is, the, is the grid controller, but ICE also is the publisher of content. What is the content? The content is the, is the context that I talked about. Who the user is, what's the session ID, is it currently on the network, uh, what is the trust set group tag, what is the MDM information. So all this rich context is available for our partners to subscribe to and uh, use that into their products. So what happens is when our partners that, who have adopted PX Grid connect to the grid, they discover topics that are available. So uh, a, a partner like Rapid7 would discover that there is a, uh, the iSession directory. They will subscribe to that. That means we also have partners that are not Cisco that can publish to the grid. So we've got partners like Infoblox is another uh, partner that is up to Info. Uh, they publish their IPAM, IP address, DSCP information on the grid. So partners like Rapid7 can also subscribe to those partners. And uh, the use case could be, for example, uh, as soon as a new system comes up on the network and an Infoblox assigns the IP address, Rapid7 can learn about that using PX Grid and immediately run a scan. So in this way, we see uh, partners uh, can, uh, can publish to the grid. So for example, we have partners coming up that can publish uh, things like sticks information. So other vendors who are adopting the grid can also subscribe to. So in this way, we build up the grid and we can have multiple integrations which are which is in a scalable manner. And, and the benefits here is that you can have a continuous flow of information because uh, you can subscribe to something similarly of how you would do for your favorite RSS feeds. So your favorite news feeds, you, you're interested in, say, golfing, you go to a golf website and subscribe to the RSS feed. And you only wait for an alert to come. You're not constantly polling to check every day whether something is new. You're waiting just for the alert to come down on the grid. But you could also do things like directed query or bulk downloads if you're connecting for the first time. So again, the reasons why we came up with this, uh, this method is that with PXGrid, uh, traditional API is a single purpose and function. But with PXGrid, we built it to be flexible. So for example, ICE gives session information. Infoblox gives IP address information. So we built it such a way that the constructs are flexible. We also have built it in a way such that our partners can also be participants on this grid such that from a customer's perspective, you can have multiple vendors talking to each other and using context among themselves. Also, if you think about it, when you do an API, you're constantly polling for information. You ask the SIM, SIM vendor or the SIM ask ICE, what is this information? Do you have this information? Do you have this information? But if you use an architecture where you don't have to poll, now what happens all of a sudden is that CPU workloads come down because there's no polling involved. So you can use that CPU for other purposes for the, the, that the appliance was intended for. Also what we did is that uh, we built security into this fabric. So just as how ICE would authenticate a user, uh, we have authentication based on certificates, uh, or based on PSK, and there's also security involved uh, so that partners who are, uh, connect to the grid need to be authorized by the ICE admin. So that it's not that anyone can just connect to the grid and get information in your deployment. So the other feature, uh, as I told you some slides ago, is this feature called adaptive network control, where our partners can reach back into the network. So using PX Grid, we, we expose an, a sub-API called ANC. What that means is that a partner can use that API to signal ICE to take a remediation action. And ICE, as I mentioned, its day job is a radius controller. So it could do traditional change of authorization, or it could be the enforcer for trust sec, so we can change regular group tags. So to illustrate this as an example, uh, let's take the Splunk use case. Uh, say, for example, Splunk is in your security operations center. 
and it is monitoring your ICE deployment. And uh, you get an alert on the Splunk interface saying that Brian is authorized on the network, but he's turned off his antivirus. So in the old days, what would happen is uh, the SOC operator would have to pick up the phone, call the endpoint team, or shoot a trouble ticket so that this can be remediated. But today, with this integration, from within the Splunk user interface, you can right-click, tell ICE to take, an, to, take an, to take an action. So what the benefit is that we're reducing a time to respond to an event that's critical. Uh, we're reducing the time and the overhead that, uh, especially in a security perspective, when you reduce time to remediate, uh, time to uh, enforce a rapid threat containment, it just makes more sense from a security perspective. So kind of in summary, um, the PX Threat framework is bi-directional in nature. That means it's not only ICE publishing to the grid. We have partners that can publish and can share. Uh, it's an any-to-any -any platform integration. What we do is that this SDK client that we give to our partners, it's available in two flavors. And our partners take that, it's available in C and Java. But that also means if you in your environments have a homegrown application, you can also adopt PXGrid. So, so, do, so to do that, we have opened it up, where, and I'll talk to you later on how you can get the SDK, et cetera. But that means if you have a homegrown application, say a database or an inventory system that is only for your environment, you could take our, our SDK as being part of Cisco DevNet and use that SDK to do an integration with your own product. The only caveat is that the, your platform needs to be either compatible with C or Java, because that's the flavors we have today. So um, again, once you integrate with PX Grid, you don't have to redo your integrations with, uh, from a partner's perspective, because it becomes an investment where if there is a new partner that has adopted PX Grid and they start sharing, the partner doesn't have to do a lot of engineering work to change the integration. You can quickly change and adopt to this new spec that this vendor has adopted. As I said, we are open, and uh, a partner or a customer like yourself can go to this website and download the, the SDKs. We have tutorials, videos on how to develop, etc. So with that, what I will do is we will look at how to develop PX Grid more, and I'll pass it on to my esteemed colleague, Sham, who is the architect, the chief architect of PX Grid. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. So, um, so uh, PX Grid is a service uh, running in ICE right now, because, uh, Identity Services Engine. So what you do is you instantiate the PX Grid service in ICE, and you can deploy the PX Grid ser service or servers in an active standby mode. Within the PX Grid server, you have the PX Grid controller, and you have the PX Grid data plane server. The controller takes care of you know, uh, all the control plane communication, like, you know, authenticating and authorizing the subscribers connecting to the PX Grid network, determining uh, what they can access, what they can subscribe to, or what they can publish to, kind of a thing. Okay, uh, creating topics, authorizing topics, so on and so forth. The, uh, the flow is analogous to file transfer protocol, if you guys are aware. In the file transfer protocol phase, there is a control plane phase, where they exchange the port information, and then there is a data plane phase. Similarly, in, P in PX Grid, the controller is the one that inter intercepts all the communication going on between the uh, clients coming in, and it sets it up and programs the XMPP data plane uh, server and gets out of the way. From there on, a publisher publishes the message and subscribers gets the message, whoever is uh, subscribed to that particular topic sort of a thing. So within PX Grid, you have a PX Grid controller, you have an XMPP data in a server uh, uh, operating at a data plane level. We chose XMPP because this is like four years back. It offers uh, various things like it, it, it offers uh, SASL simple authentication mechanisms, it offers centralized authorization, it supports federation, like a company X can talk to company Y, it can offer domain segregation, it can know the presence like Jabber presence of Brian on the network or Sham on the network kind of a thing, and it's completely decentralized. So in the latest we are adding, we, are, we, we have it on the roadmap to add uh, the REST, REST and WebSocket interfaces, and we're also trying to address the cloud deployments. 
So the participants participating in PX Grid right now use what we call as a PX Grid client. With, so what we offer to the ecosystem is a SDK, software defined kit, development kit, where with samples and a sample library they can embed to intuitively, to use simple intuitive APIs to connect, log in, publish, subscribe or query sort of a thing. And right now we support uh, Java and C languages with REST and WebSocket uh, editions that are going to come in the next one year or so, it completely becomes uh, language agnostic, basically. That's the approach we want to take. So uh, the medium of communication in PX Grid is what we call is a, as a topic. Think of it like an information channel. Um, a publisher creates an information channel or a topic and makes it available on the PX Grid network. And all the participants on PX Grid uh, get to know about the topic presence. They discover the topic. And the publisher of the topic will determine what is he going to publish, what queries is he going to entertain, or what actions are supported on that particular topic sort of a thing. Can you go to the next uh, slide, please? So why did we choose PX Grid? In, in ICE 1.0 time frame, like four years ago, ICE being a AAA server, um, it has a purview of all the active users on the network. It knows the users, the user groups, the device types, where is he on the network, so on and so forth. Generally, we call it as contextual intelligence. And there are a variety of uh, applications and systems out there in the network that would like to consume the contextual information from ICE, like a security event management system wants to enrich the IP and MAC address-based logs with user information so that it becomes intuitive to see what's going on uh, in, with the security event sort of a thing. So there is a there was a demand at that point to consume as much information as possible from ICE, and the available mechanisms are syslog, where you can direct the syslog messages going into ICE monitoring and troubleshooting node to an external server, or we even expose REST API. The problem with REST API is uh, the systems that want to get information from ICE have to periodically poll, and polling is a very expensive exercise, and because of ICE architecture uh, limitations around that point. To download about 200,000 endpoints, it used to take uh, take three hours using REST API. And uh, it's, uh, so the demand increasingly was also towards uh, systems asking for a real-time notification as and when ICE learns uh, the events coming into the network. And the requirements were like uh, real-time notification, ability to query on a particular IP address, session information on a particular IP address, ability to download um, you know, uh, all the sessions if, let's assume a fireside management center that you worked on goes through power cycle and it loses all the information. It can go query I saying from this particular timestamp, can you give me all the sessions sort of a thing. So providing the flexible API mechanisms for subscribers to consume information and also providing message filters, like a branch firewall doesn't want all the campus events. It just needs that particular um, you know, branch subnet events, basically. Ability for the server to filter out those messages and give the exact precise messages to the branch firewall. These were the demands that necessitated the need for a PX grid server. Next slide, please. So what we offer, as we discussed, we offer a client library that the application, the 50 partners that Brian talked about, or Fireset Management Center kind of applications can embed. Uh, uh, and uh, we hide the nuances of all the XMPP REST mechanism that we use. And we provide some four or five simple intuitive APIs for the applications to consume. The way it is for us is a partnering application that wants to use PX Grid. Typically, it takes a couple of days to complete the integration. That's about it. And we provide sample data. We also provide a radius simulator. Imagine uh, somebody in Splunk uh, trying to integrate PX Grid. You don't want to overwhelm the guy with uh, needing a full-fledged ICE deployment with authentications and all, right? So what we give them is a simple virtual machine, which is completely primed, and a radius simulator to generate some radius sessions, and uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a client library, and a couple of videos and tutorials sort of a thing. Using that, they complete the integration, and then we move them to a phase two integration testing scenario, where uh, th that's when uh, we, we take them to a DevNet environment, where they can test, test it in a live ICE deployment scenario sort of a thing. So what does the client library do, right? The client, uh, the application integrates the client library, specifies the PX Grid servers uh, that it wants to connect, like a switch configuring a AAA server setting sort of a thing. 
because you say that IP uh, AAA server 1.1.1, 2.2.2 sort of a thing. The switch tries AAA server 1, if it doesn't go reachable, it goes to AAA server 2 sort of thing, right? Very similarly, with the application that is integrating the GCL client, uh, we, you have to specify the servers and it uses, uh, it tries to reach the servers in a round robin fashion. So uh, you need to provision the certificate if you want to use certificate-based authentication. We support self-signed certificates, we support CA-signed certificates as well. And there is a recent tradition where uh, to accelerate uh, deployment of PX grade, people ask for a pre-shared key authentication mechanism, not certificate-based mechanism. We support pre-shared key mechanism as well. And uh, you know the capabilities generally are they can uh, connect, uh, similar to Jabber, they need to have an account to log in. The PX grid controller approves the login, account approval. They can publish or they can subscribe, they can query or they can do a bulk, a bulk download. So as, as we discussed, think of it like this, right? Uh, the good example is ICE uh, session topic. ICE monitoring and troubleshooting that is getting the radius events has the information of all the active users in the network. So we created a topic and within the topic we said uh, these are the attributes we can publish. And the, and the monitoring and troubleshooting node in ICE, which is a publisher for the session topic, exposed a bunch of APIs for the subscribers to make a directed query on. Like, you know, they can query based on an IP address or a MAC address, or they can make queries between a time range to learn all the sessions that it missed out because of a network outage or a power outage or a kind of a scenario. And it can also take some EPS or adaptive network control actions that Brian mentioned a while back, right? In addition, on this particular topic, the publisher specifies the message filters it can make available. For the session topic, the message filters we made available are subnets. Going back to the previous example, a firewall installed in a branch is only interested in the branch-specific subnet information, events, and nothing else. So we call them as uh, you know, semant semantic filtering, like a subnet-based semantic filtering sort of a thing. That is something we support in ICE session topic. And it's really the prerogative of the topic uh, producer to define the additional message cr filtering criteria. And these message filters are usually done at a publisher level. We can also do it on a server because of the load considerations. We right now implemented it only on the publishers. So schema-based filtering, like you know, if you have 20 attributes that a publisher wants to publish, ability to receive only four or five attributes is something that we looked at, but we didn't find a solid use case yet to deliver. So what we did in the latest uh, uh, re release of ICE is we offered a uh, feature called Dynamic Topics. The earlier versions of PX Grade is uh, the service runs inside ICE and only we have ICE uh, topics running, like uh, ICE session topic, endpoint topic, trustsec topic, where ICE uh, services are the publishers alone. And there is no concept of entertaining a Splunk, a Splunk directly talking to a Rapid7 uh, vulnerability service without ICE involvement. So with Dynamic Topics Edition, we provided an ability where anyone can create a topic programmatically and that goes through an administrator approval process on the UI and then a publisher can publish the message and non-ICE consumers can receive the message sort of a thing. That is the flexibility we offered as, as part of Dynamic Topics. So. So what we do, right, uh, the uh, good example is uh, Infoblox. Let's take an Infoblox example. It has a list of IP addresses uh, uh, and endpoints that, uh, that have requested uh, IP address as part of DHCP or IP address management. It keeps track of the list of bad hosts that have tried to access the Infoblox IP address management system. So what it can do, Infoblox can create a topic called bad host topic, for example. It can publish the subset of IP addresses which it knows as bad host, and it can publish that information with the objective that a Qualys or a Tenable or a Rapid7 can pick up the bad host IP addresses and dynamically trigger a vulnerability scan. Think of it as example. To do this, Infoblox programmatically creates a topic called bad host topic and the topic shows up in ICE administration UI for approval, and the topic gets approved. As part of the topic approval, we, it, ICE automatically generates the authorization profiles. 
like what 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 can a subscribe be authorized to do on this particular topic kind of a thing generally the publisher in this case the info blocks also will do, will specify these are the attributes i'm going to publish and these are the various actions that a subscriber can take by participating in this topic around those actions we auto create ice auto creates authorization groups in this particular case you know uh, the authorization group publish means uh, it can give permission to publish messages a subscribe means a subscriber can subscribe to that message an action means like you know delete a bad host for example uh, qualis can do a vulnerability scan on a particular ip address that it learned from uh, info blocks it does the vulnerability scan and it detects everything is all right it can go back and tell info blocks delete this particular host from your list sort of a thing that's an action so when a subscriber subscribes to that particular topic called let's say bad host topic if it is part of this action group authorization group which is set on the ui it can take those actions sort of a thing so how does it work right like you said we give a virtual machine we pre canned virtual machine with ice install um you can you can go you have to go to the ice ui to install the certificates or use a pre shared key mechanism of authenticating the px grid clients you have to deploy the px grid service inside ice and we provide uh, a, a client library with a couple of samples to use and we also provide scripts to publish subscribe and the and the, in, the, the intention is to allow the is to allow an application developer to simply focus on application integration and not uh, worry about the network nuances kind of a thing so the most commonly used things are uh, like i said the api is the client library provides a mechanism to register to subscribe to download to query for a session topic to query based on ip address to quarantine a user for example if i if qualis uh, detects a vulnerability failure or a cvss score of 9.0 on a particular endpoint which is like an extremely malicious situation sort of a thing it can uh, uh, it can subscribe to an anc topic running inside ice and it can quarantine it can also unquarantine users sort of a thing perfect thanks sham so all in all what we uh, uh, have shown you here is that we we allow partners to kind of use the context and ice and also use the same integration to take an action on your behalf also using the grid you can do integrations with other vendors so that from a customer's perspective you have your different uh security products talking to each other now leveraging the same infrastructure so how do we recruit partners uh, or any any anyone that wants to adopt px grid we have taken it open and when i say open we are in we are on cisco devnet cisco devnet is free to join as a customer or a partner uh, once you register on devnet uh, and you go to the px grid instance you basically get access to the the videos on how to develop you get access to the sdks you get access to ice downloads uh, you get access to uh, how to guides and tutorials and how to build up sample applications and um, you also have a community where you can ask questions and you can get support on uh, what we do is that typically our partners that have adopted they go through px grid on devnet after they have tested it to work they come back to us and we certify them Uh, they provide how to guide and we create an uh, a way of how we can support our joint customers and then we publish that as uh, officially certified what we've also done and sham kind of alluded to this is that we have also on devnet a sandbox so a sandbox is available on on devnet which has an instance of px grid it's always on 24/7 it has an instance of ice it has instance of switches Uh, uh microsoft ad the radio simulator so our partners get an oep ap shipped to their premises and all they do is on the van side connect back to cisco cloud on the lan side they connect their application so that they can begin to do the integration testing without needing to set up the whole ice infrastructure etc so uh this we allow and this is always on 24/7 that's managed by the cisco devnet team So uh that's all we have for you today. Um uh, to learn more about PX Red please feel free to visit that website. Um uh 
that uh, that's developerscisco.com slash pxgrid or the shortcut URL is uh, www.cisco.com slash go slash pxgrid partner and or you could do a Google search for pxgrid as well. Uh, you can you can if you have certain partners that are not in the ecosystem yet through your Cisco uh, sales rep, you could contact them and, you, and we can start talking with those, part, with those companies to see if they want to adopt to the grid. If you have a homegrown application, uh, you are free to use PXGrid to use an integration from the contacts from ICE. Uh, if you want to learn more how to actually begin coding, we have got a workbench tomorrow at around 2 o'clock where you can actually, we have a sample application for you to come in and uh, understand what the development looks like. You have, ac you, have, you have time to go through a lab where you will get the flavor of how uh, you can begin to integrate using PXGrid. And on Thursday, we have a little deeper session on dynamic topics where we will go a little more in deep of how dynamic topics are. We'll also cover a um, little, uh, little bit of the background on PXGrid again. So uh, feel free to encourage your friends that have missed this session or you could come back again uh, and we could talk more about PXRID. Any questions for you folks get, that we can help answer? Uh, could you repeat the question? Uh, currently only the eyes can act as a PXRID controller. That is correct. So the question is, is to, uh, today only eyes can act as a PXRID controller? That's a good question. Um, we built PXRID to be modular in nature. So today, ICE is the PXGrid server and the ICE business unit and engineering team is the maintainer of the code. But uh, maybe, uh, maybe in short time we, uh, we have, uh, we, you can see other Cisco platforms adopt PXGrid. Uh, because we build it as a, as a modular in nature, uh, the intent is for other product platforms within Cisco to use that as well. Because it enables a pub sub mechanism that's easy for other vendors to adopt to. So an another perspective, right? PXGrid needs a user interface or a system manager. ICE, uh, with la last five years of development, provides you the management infrastructure and the complete serviceability infrastructure, our ability to deploy, gather the logs, troubleshoot. So uh, instead of building yet another system, we thought integrating into ICE would make sense initially. So. Yeah, and, and also ICE was the main producer of the information. But tomorrow you could use another platform that maybe does analytics in Cisco that could be a beneficiary of this technology. Yeah, so, is, so the question is, we men, I mentioned XMPP before. Uh, the question is, is PXGrid going to be an open standard? So we have taken PXGrid to two uh, it, so currently, PXRID is, is in two working groups of the IETF for standardization. It's in the SACM working group the, uh, and the MILE working group. So we have just got approved for standards track for the MILE working group. So we are looking to get it standardized. What we are also doing is we are going to open source the, the client. So soon you will see, maybe, uh, we are currently working on the logistics for supportability, but uh, we are going to open source the client as well. So we can have other vendors also adopt that. So XMPP is standardized, as you know. So PXCrate, the way we submitted the internet draft in IETF, is as an extension to XMPP, as an overlay on top of XMPP. I'm sorry? Yeah, we need to install ICE, yes. No, you don't, because ICE is really used for, the question is, do you need, when you standardize PX grade, do you need to, hey, does it have a dependency on ICE, is the question. The, the answer is, ICE is just a system manager. Like, you know, managing, you know, approving the topics, approving the accounts kind of a thing. So that, that doesn't require standardization. You, all you call for is, a, we are not standardizing the system management aspect. We are standardizing the centralized authentication, authorization, and the information models. If somebody doesn't have the ICE deployment today, the PX grid cannot be deployed. But in future, if we relax it, it can be deployed. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other questions? All right. So thank you so much, folks, for your time. And uh, have, a nice, have a nice evening. Thank you all. I appreciate you. it. Bye.